So welcome, I'm just going to be doing a brief tutorial on using materialized mimics to create 3D models of, a, in this case, a humerus. So as we open up materialized mimics here, I'm just going to go through briefly opening up the document. So if you have your DICOM images available, just click on new project and open up the folder that contains all of your CT DICOM uh, images. And it should open up relatively easily uh, if everything's set up right. A convenient feature in Mimics here is it'll actually auto-name your, your project to your patient name that was inputted by the CT technician originally. Now you can see here I'm just indicating what's known as a phantom, so that's just a bottle of water. On the, uh, on the right humerus is indicated out in the title of this particular uh, CT image, and it's, it'll just help me isolate which, which is the left arm and which, which is the right arm, as in this particular example for my study, I need to isolate and create a 3D model of the left humerus. Now, as we navigate through our CT images here, you can see on the, the scroll bar and by using the scroll wheel, you can uh, tab through all of the CT slices <clears throat> in the plane that you're working on. Now, using the control uh, right-click drag function, you can zoom in and zoom out and using the shift right-click drag function, you can uh, pan through your image to, to help you navigate to exactly where you want to see. So now, as you can see, what I'm doing here is I'm just playing around with contrast settings to isolate what I consider to be a, uh, a cortical shell uh, of, of my humerus. And now this doesn't affect the CT uh, data whatsoever. It's just a visual representation within Mimics itself, and it's it's just going to help me personally to isolate that cortical shell so I can segment it in the next step. So although this process of preloading your contrast settings isn't particularly necessary per se, I would highly suggest it as it's exceptionally helpful in providing you with a, a visual preview of exactly what you're going to be targeting to threshold in these next few steps. So as you can see here, I'm using the Mimics native profile line feature to really, I'm just mimicking um, as best I can the thresholding that I previously did just using those basic contrast settings within Mimics. And as you can see here, it's, it's exceptionally easy to really get, uh, if not exactly, a very similar a mask as, as you originally did just by using those basic contrast settings. And after you complete at least what is your primary rendition of your of your mask, uh, I would very much so suggest that you crop your mask to just the local area that you're going to be working with uh, for the course of your study, as some features in Mimics itself are either very slow or will not function uh, at all if you're still working with a, a global mask. So as you can see here, I just really qu quickly cropped the mask and now I'm gonna use the split mask feature in order to really isolate my humerus. Now for this particular step, I usually like to uh, isolate the most proximal um, aspect of the humerus as it allows us to get rid of a lot of the, sp uh, the, the speckling pattern that is the result of more dense trabeculae um, in the, the humeral epiphyseal head. So as you can see here, my, my original uh, split mass seems to have worked out pretty well. And although this isn't a perfect humeral image, uh, it at least gives me a baseline on which to begin my, uh, my process. So as you can really see here, uh, unfortunately, our cortical shell model is nowhere near complete. There are many voids still within our model, and those will make any kind of attempt to create a functional 3D model um, impossible uh, within the context of, of trying to differentiate between the, the cortical shell and the trabecular inside of the humerus. There is a native function um, in Mimics itself called 3D Interpolate, but I would actually suggest you avoid using this feature as sometimes it, it overestimates the thickness of the, of the shell itself, or sometimes it just won't work entirely if your voids are too large. So in this particular case, my best suggestion is actually to go, and as you can see I'm doing here, individually 
uh, at each uh, segmented, uh, I guess, slice, CT slice, you really need to individually go and complete the image as best you can. Unfortunately, as you can see here, it, it will be relatively time consuming in order to complete each individual slice image. And to ensure that your segmented cortical shell is complete, you can probably allot, at least in my case uh, for a humerus, I can usually allot 45 minutes to an hour uh, for this process if you're doing it uh, correctly. And if you're trying to make a thorough a 3D model of, of a cortical shell differentiated from a trabecular interior. So I'm just going to speed through all of this so you don't need to watch the process uh, completely, but although this is by far the most tedious step in this entire uh, process of developing a 3D model from CT scans, it is also possibly the, the most important. So as with any large project, make sure you save after you've completed any large steps. And as you can see here, I'm going to be using a native function uh, within Mimix to automatically, or at least attempt to automatically fill any gaps or voids in, in my cortical shell here. As much as I would suggest this process, I'm still not sure how really effective it is. And uh, in some cases, depending on the overall speed and power of your, of your computer, it may take a substantially long time. So it might be worth just skipping this step. But as you can see here, I'm just renaming as, uh, as that process generated a new mask. I'm just renaming the, the masks uh, so I can keep track of really what I'm working with. Now, as we continue along here, I'm just going to uh, generate a 3D model of what we've completed so far. And as you can see, there are still numerous voids and, and gaps within this model. Now, if you were purely making a solid body, you likely would be able to you know, finish up here. However, in the context of us creating a, a cortical shell and a trabecular uh, mass inside of said shell, we, we actually need to make sure that our original masks are, are complete as opposed to just jumping straight to, to the step. So um, as far as this process itself, we're just really looking to see where the largest voids still are in our mask. And then we're going to jump back into our CT images to segment uh, further the, the mask that generated this 3D image. And after clicking on the location of interest in that 3D model, we're jumping back into our sagittal plane here. And although we, in the coronal plane, really did our best to make a complete um, cortical shell, you can see here in our sagittal plane, unfortunately, there are still quite a few voids. So you're going to have to repeat the process that you originally did with the coronal plane. Um, or I guess whatever primary plane you were working with. And you're going to have to repeat it for these next two planes in order to ensure that you really do have a full uh, cortical shell. And you know, as is evident here, some of the gaps are actually going to be quite large. So I would suggest that you really make sure to double check as best you can to ensure that you really do have a cortical shell as it will be imperative when we decide to fill in the trabecular interior that you have a fully defined cortical shell. So now that we've completed kind of the basic uh, three-plane operation of trying our best to, to complete the mask, at least uh, as, as much visually as we can, 
uh, we're going to create another 3D model, and as you can see there, it's, it's looking quite a bit better. Now, create, uh, of course, afterwards, create a, a mask, essentially delimited, and uh, th this will essentially just fill in all of the negative space of the CT uh, with, with a mask. And what we're going to do here is we're just going to treat everything inside the cortical shell as trabecular bone. So once you have completed filling in all of the negative space, I perform a Boolean operation here, and I'm actually just going to subtract from my new mask my cortical shell. And this will allow me to use that split mask function once again um, in order to differentiate between the internal structure and the external, um, I guess, the, the rest of the mask externally to my, my cortical shell here. Now, unfortunately, due to kind of the limitations of distinguishing between trabecular bone and bone marrow, we're going to be treating everything inside of our cortical shell as one material. And we're going to, of course, when we're performing our finite element analysis, we're just going to be using those same conditions and that same linear approximation of bone density to uh, Young's modulus, uh, as, is, as is indicated in the literature regardless of whether or not the material we're working with is bone marrow or uh, trabecular bone. So as this operation finishes, you can see me just scrolling through uh, what uh, Mimics has, has isolated as our trabecular bone, but of course there are going to be some minor uh, errors that you're going to have to touch up yourself. And it's important to do this as you really want two solid bodies um, for your trabecular and your cortical bone. You, you don't want to have any uh, unattached um, little solid solid bodies that are just floating around outside. There is a way to get rid of those within the 3D models, but I find that sometimes using the automatic functions of Mimix can be a bit finicky, so my suggestion is just to do everything manually um, in this context of really trying to differentiate between cortical and trabecular bone. Now as we get into performing operations on our 3D model here, I would very much suggest that you perform any operations on the trabecular interior first. So this would include these wrapping functions. And it's important also to make sure that you, you highlight that dilate result uh, checkbox when you're performing the wrapping functions. And in the context of the smooth uh, function, make sure that you deselect com uh, compensate shrinkage. And this is just because we, we want to limit the amount of interference between our cortical shell and our trabecular bone model. And now inversely here, uh, when we're working with our cortical shell, make sure that you instead select prot protect thin walls when you're performing the wrap function. And for your smooth function, you really want to compensate for shrinkage as you don't want your, uh, you don't want your cortical shell to begin to interfere with, with the trabecular bone model that you've, you've already developed here. Now, as it looks like we still have a little bit of an interference uh, between our trabecular and cortical bone uh, in this particular instance, just make sure that you continue to wrap until you have a very solid cortical shell. And this shouldn't be too detrimental to your, to your uh, through the, the accuracy of your 3D model here. Um, you just really wanna make sure that there's no encroachment of your trabecular um, interior on your on your cortical shell. Now, just uh, performing another step to really ensure that there's no interference, I like to perform a Boolean subtraction, actually subtracting the cortical shell from my trabecular interior. Now, this ensures that you're not shrinking your your trabecular uh, inside really at all, and you're you're just making sure that there's no interference between the two parts. Now that we've I'm relatively confident that this is uh, an accurate and full uh, part. So essentially right now, just make sure you save your work and export uh, your documents. Now, it's also important that you're using an ASCII STL as opposed to a binary STL. 
And this is just important as it's, it's read, at least as far as my experience goes, it's interpreted by SOLIDWORKS quite a bit easier. Now, as a personal preference, I like to ensure that all of my file naming conventions are properly followed. And, uh, and of course, that the specimens are, are saved into the correct place. Um, so my suggestion would to be to, of course, do this internally uh, within Mimics as opposed to uh, renaming them uh, using the auto-generated uh, convention names. So just as we're finishing up here to open these models in SOLIDWORKS, ensure that you're using the internal open function native to SOLIDWORKS and you're not just clicking on those .stl files. Now, unfortunately, uh, this parsing and processing step is deceivingly long and at least uh, I found that, you know, when I was originally doing this process, I would assume that it wasn't actually working. But if you have, you know, enough patience, it should ultimately uh, give you solid bodies that you can convert into SOLIDWORKS parts. So now that we've saved both of our cortical and trabecular uh, imported solid bodies as their own SOLIDWORKS parts, of course you can put them directly into a SOLIDWORKS assembly. Now I, I personally like to use just mating the, the two origins together in order to align them correctly. And after, of course, you, you perform your mating function, ensure that you fix both of these parts. It's not shown here, but it's, it's quite important as if you're performing any reaming or position uh, procedures for implants, you really want to make sure that these two uh, solid bodies don't move with respect to one another. Mm -hmm. 